Hello everybody! Welcome to another Valheim video. Today we have another interview. How are you doing? And how should I refer to you? I mean, just call me Nest. I go by Nest Irish, but Nest is Nestor? more familiar okay. and more comfortable. So just Nest. Awesome. And Hi, we're everybody. Gonna talking, we're going to be talking about Valheim, <laughs> as usual. So what I want to focus on is I want to hear your Valheim story. And the best place to start with everyone's Valheim story is before Valheim. So could you tell me a little bit about, like, what were you doing before you played Valheim? What kinds of games were you interested in? What were you playing? And what were your just general feelings about gaming before Valheim came into your life? Well, I've been a big MMO fan uh, way back in 2001 when Dark Age of Camelot came out. That was my first game. And every once in a while, I'll still dive into it because of nostalgic reasons. But uh, I, I went on, everybody did WoW, I did WoW, and uh, other games uh, as well. Uh, finally settled on Elder Scrolls Online, which I played for about six years before uh, Valheim came out. And I was big into that as well. Really enjoyed the game. I enjoyed the community aspect of it and being able to just create some online friends and hang out with people with similar interests and just kind of have fun and, and, and enjoy the game itself. And then Valheim came out and I wasn't sure about it, but a friend of mine actually gifted me the game a week after it came out. And the second I played it, I knew this was it. This was a great game. So much fun, so much to do. Uh, it's just fantastic. So that's pretty much my Valheim story. So, so out of curiosity, had you played? Did you play the other Elder Scrolls games much before Elder Scrolls Online? Skyrim, I did. I did Skyrim and a little bit of Morrowind, uh, but not much of the others. Uh, I have gotten those games since then. I just haven't had a chance to play them. Oh, if you ever get a chance. Um, so the original Daggerfall is it's really hard to get into, but someone remade it in Unity and it has full mod support. And I played it recently as a first-time player, and holy shit, it shocked me. I, I get it now. I get what, <laughs> where Elder Scrolls came from. And so I just this isn't anything to do with Valheim, but almost all Valheim players like Elder uh, Scrolls. So, so realistic. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I appreciate the tip. I am definitely going to have to try that out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite cool. And there's a lot of mods that you can add to it to make it a little bit more modern. Um, but it's something I, 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 I like studying that game because I'm, I'm into game development and I want to develop games. I'm not quite there yet, but one of the things that I'm fascinated by by Daggerfall Unity is that uh, they basically have a lot of 2D sprites that they move like this. So it, it gives you the impression of 3D, but it's not. It, it's 2D. And what was so shocking to me is playing it. I felt like I was playing Oblivion, like fighting just normally. And oh, sometimes really? the enemy would dodge and I was like, I can have fun playing a 2D sprite combat? I had no idea. But yeah, <laughs> ju just because you mentioned Elder Scrolls and stuff, it's definitely worth checking out. So, so but I, won't, I, I don't want to get go check it out. Too, too off the topic of Valheim. So, so you started with, did you play with your friend? Because he, he gifted it to you? Uh, yes, actually, yeah. Um, uh, it was a surprise. I didn't expect her to do it. And uh, we, we played with a few other people. She doesn't play it as much anymore. She's into a lot of other games, but she'll still come in. She came back for Ashlands. But, uh, yeah, she, she and I played with her husband and my son for a while and, and a, a bunch of other people that we know. And we still have that community where we hang out and jump in and, and play together on a different server, you know, one that's built for us that we did a while back and it is it's, it's still a lot of fun with with them and that's the best aspect of the game friends it, it really has that cooperative element to it you know that's quite a yeah it's quite fascinating so so you mentioned specifically um you you could tell immediately something was different about valheim can you elaborate more what do you mean by that the feel of the game. The combat was... I enjoyed the combat. It was smooth to me. It was very smooth. I, I liked it a lot. The look... I actually wasn't sure about the look at first, but 
it just very quickly grew on me. I just loved the feel of it. The lighting is amazing in that game. To be honest with you, it's fantastic. Uh, and just the way you could build, building is so much fun. That's really my favorite part of the game, to be fair. And, but it's it, it doesn't throw you into the lion's den immediately. You start off, especially when you don't know what you're doing as a new player, you don't. Ha there's not a steep learning curve, but it, it can be. It will be tough as you go down. And I like how they laid that out as well. They didn't throw everything in your face at once. You got to get comfortable with the game and develop and create what you need for your play style. And it, it was just a nice, easy, peaceful feeling. And the music was great too. I love. I'll, I'll be at work sometimes, and I'll just throw on a loop of ten hour loop of uh, the Meadows music and just kind of keep me, keep my blood pressure down at work. So, so uh, the total package was fantastic. So, so what yeah, happened? That, yeah. What happens next for you? Well, um, because of the video series really that you've put out, I'm, I'm getting into learning how to mod. I, I do have a, a private server now with, that I want to have friends come on, but I want to be able to, set it up so we can use different things. I want to be able to put my own dungeons in there, for example. I want to build a starting town uh, around the uh, spawn point, the main spawn point, so people that come in can have a little bit of an edge when they come in, but I'm not going to uh, make it... I'm not going to hold their hand through the game, especially the few that have never played it. I want them to experience it the, the way I, that you and I did. So... Um, I'm getting into that. I'm learning. It's 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 kind of tough. I'm not going to lie, but I enjoy the challenge, and I enjoy it. And I've learned a lot from, like I said before we started, the videos you put out. I really appreciate them because it's just uh, been so helpful. And I, I really want to get into that and learn more about how to write the scripts and put them where to put them first of all <laughs> in the config files. So things like that. Uh, that's next for me, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the deep north too. Uh, that's awesome. And that's, that's the exact role I'm trying to play because I, I know nothing about this stuff, to be honest. And I'm, what's funny is it puts me in a good position to make tutorials for beginners because most of the others... Have you uh, participated in the Valheim world editing server much on Discord? Or I go there quite frequently and I just look and see and I try to, I try to be like a sponge and absorb whatever I can in the chat yeah. and in, in the different channels they have in there just so i don't crash the server and so i can learn and be better at it so but it's a it's a learning process but i enjoy it yeah i mean it's uh it, it's definitely challenging it's like uh but well, something i've noticed is most of the people who really know what they're doing they're they know too much they're too technical so like they from the beginner's perspective it's unapproachable so my role is sort of to help mesh these different uh expertises let's say and because I really don't, I mean, like compared to like Raka and Dakar and GRA and these others, I know nothing about how stuff works. <laughs> like I, the way I make scripts is by looking at other people's scripts and taking bits and Frankensteining them together. And, and then I'll show it to someone <laughs> and they'll be like, why are you doing like these 20 lines of things that you can just do this one value for? And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah, now I'm scared. <laughs> now I'm scared. <laughs> no, no, it, it always starts off simple, and then things become complex over time. So there's no need to be intimidated. Even, even like Dakar and them, they've made like the adventure map and all sorts of incredibly complicated things. But he was just telling me in, in the interview I just did with him that like his first shack in Valheim was just like any other shitty Valheim shack. It was like people always start <laughs> off simple. So don't. Don't worry too much about like the not knowing and these things, because I mean, I, I if I if I waited until I fully understood everything and felt fully confident, I couldn't make tutorials. And by the time you get to that point, you've forgotten what it's like for the confused beginner. So, so really, just just keep keep going at it and have fun, and that's what uh what what makes it so magical. So, so I'm curious, what what are you interested in? What draws you to because a lot of Alheim players, they won't necessarily get into the modding or the, the this other part of the game, right? So I'm curious, what 
what about that is appealing to you and what kinds of things are you interested in doing? I like the idea, especially with a, a dedicated server, to keep bringing people back. It, a lot of a lot of people I know have killed off the bosses, and then they go on to something else because what's left to do. But I like the idea of having them do other things, maybe not an adventure map, but being able to find hidden towns in a swamp. Yeah. Or uh, a, hit, uh, a creepy castle in Mistlands, or something that they can go into and explore, and uh, learn how to put mo make them like dungeons, so they have more to do than just the base game. It, it won't take away from the game itself, but it hopefully add more enjoyment and longevity to the game. Yeah, just to add lifespan. to it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, Valheim is definitely one of those games that if you play it vanilla, you get to a point where you learn the procedural generation, and yeah, you may not have explored every black forest, but you know, like, if you do explore the black forest, maybe you'll find two Grey Dwarf spawners next to each other, or like, something like that, where, you know, it's rare, but... It just, mm -hmm. it, it, it gets to a point where you, it, it seems, it feels too predictable and players tend to drop off once they start figuring out, it, you know, because when you first play, Absolutely. it's like, whoa, this, this mystery and this magic, you know? So I, I think I understand what you're getting at because if you add locations, especially in the more dangerous biomes, this is part of the discussion I just had with Dakar, is that... Valheim really, the, the things that keep people playing in Valheim is building. So when, mm -hmm. when you just do combat, it, it's very typical that the player will progress, kill a boss, stop playing, and leave. That's basically what happens. And I've noticed that. So. The beginning of the game does a really good job of giving you safety that you can retreat back into, right, with the meadows. Mm -hmm. Whereas later in the game, that element is missing. So I'm hoping that they change that, but they don't even need to. You know, really, Iron Gate has given us all the tools we need, along with Yere and all these other modders, that we can make the answers to this. And it sounds like that's what you're getting at. So is there, is there something I can help, um, help you understand, or I could sort of help you ex understand how to go about doing it that you, you're not sure if it's possible or anything like that? Uh, not off the top of my head. I'm still, uh, I'm not even crawling yet. I'm in the, the uh, in, very infant stages, very much in the infant stage of doing this. Uh, I do have ideas of what I'd like to do, but I've got to figure out where, like I said a little bit earlier, where to put the, the lines of code when you go into the config file. And, and uh, so I don't crash the game or send my player to Orgrimmar somehow. <laughs> Well, the, the good news is, at least if you're talking about expand world prefabs, um, most of the time, if you crash it, it's just going to break all of your changes. You don't, because expand world prefabs is a text config file and it is scripting, but you don't actually put it in the game itself. It's loaded on top of the game. So it's very hard to actually like break the game because you'll normally just break all of your scripts. So... Basically, you'll gotcha. add something and then well, you get some error messages in the log and like nothing happens. Although, don't get me wrong, it is possible to cause infinite loops which will crash your server, but then you just <laughs> disable the script and it like you, you can't really break the game. You can just cause it to restart and then you have to disable your, your script. You're not going to like, you know, screw up the world file with expand world prefab so extensively that, you know, you butcher it. At least I've, I haven't heard right, of that that's good happening. Enough. <laughs> maybe, maybe you could be the first. but <laughs> Challenge accepted. Uh, one, one question I do have. Is it possible to alter the world with Expand World Prefab, for example, and make new locations, but the people that come into the server don't have to have the mods enabled? They can come in at vanilla. They, I have some friends that don't like mods, and they won't mod. Yeah. And I'd still like them to be able to join in and play. Is that something that is possible? Yeah, so, okay, terrain is off limits. You can't add new biomes. You can't, um, like, make it so there's a custom biome without them having something. But 
you can add, basically there's ways to convert blueprints into expand mm -hmm. world prefab scripts. So it's possible, for example, to have a server where when you place a workbench, the server automatically builds a hut on top of it. And that's totally vanilla. Um, as far as adding blueprints to the spawning mechanism of the server, I'm not sure. I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. I know that you can make it so you, you basically add your own locations to the random world generation. So you can make it so your castle is one of the possible things that shows up in that particular biome. But I'm not completely sure if that's possible with expand world prefabs, because in general with expand world prefabs, you can modify the data file and you can modify the mm -hmm. prefab file. But when it actually gets to the locations themselves, I'm not sure. So I can't give you a, a definite answer, oh. but I, I can tell you that you can make That's... expand world prefabs build things. So for example, let's say that you want to replace an existing location, maybe one tenth of the time with your custom location. The way that would work basically with expand world prefabs and be vanilla friendly is like when the player gets sort of near the location and it generates, one of the items in that location can act as a trigger, which will then cause everything to get wiped and deleted, and then cause your thing to get built there. But it, it'll look a bit weird. So like the player will sort of see a building uh, like demolish and, and get built because you have to react to what the player does with expand world prefabs. You can't just alter the game so that when they load the area for the first time, it is uh, different. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Totally makes sense. It'd be kind of funny to hear their reactions if they saw if they run up a building just explodes and then a new one takes its place. Yeah, that would be kind of just. I, I'd be interested to hear what they said. All right, that that that's cool. Thank you for answering that. Yeah, and there, so, and and again, I could be wrong about that because I know I know you can add locations. You can literally. It's pretty easy to add. A blueprint to the list of locations that the game will generate but I think that might require a client-side mod in order for it to work I'm not I'm not entirely sure uh, just because Valheim itself okay. um, uh, Valheim itself doesn't have a way to look at blueprints so like when you um, convert a blueprint for example to expand world prefabs basically what's happening is you take all of the pieces from the blueprint and then you tie them to a trigger and then it'll build it basically in steps. But it's literally yeah. manually spawning every piece. It doesn't know that that's a location. It just knows once this happens, do this and build all these pieces and snap them together and make the thing. So you can make that happen relative to a center point. So, and you can like okay. cover it all up with visual effects. So like, you know, they load the thing, and then after like 10 seconds, the tower off in the distance gets struck by a lightning bolt, and there's a huge explosion. And then when the mist clears, it's a totally different building. That you can do. That's kind of cool. Um, I actually like that idea. Yeah, so, so that, that would be totally possible with vanilla, uh, vanilla friendly clients. But the things you want are, are doable. And really, with Expand World Prefabs, oh, cool. the only hard limits really or like you can't cause new biomes to occur you could alter the biomes by reacting to the vegetation and replacing it with other stuff so you can make for example your black forest can half the trees get deleted when they spawn so it's thinner and more instance friendly you can do that sort of stuff but as far as actual biomes oh, you can't cool. do that and anything in the ui so like the player's inventory the player's skills doesn't exist as far as the server is concerned. It's all handled completely locally. So that's off limits. But any okay. item on the ground, items in chests, anything in the game server, that's all able to be manipulated. And really it's all about figuring that's, that's out cool. what's your trigger going to be and then what are you going to do in response to that trigger. That's pretty much the basics of it. 
I'm even more excited to dive into it now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, what do you think, I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen with the Deep North? I'd like to hear other people's ideas. I, I'm not really sure, to be honest. I, I mean, I have a... So, like, I have this belief with Valheim that the endgame stuff, really, it's not going to be experienced by the vast majority of Valheim players. It serves as, like, a, something to keep players feeling like they haven't done everything, which keeps the game more immersive. But in general, at least what I noticed with Ashlands, is when it actually launched... Most of the players, this is just my opinion, I could be wrong about it. Most of the players joined to play Ashlands. But all that they really end up doing is doing another Valheim playthrough and stopping before Ashlands. So the Deep North, I'm sure, will be a cool biome. Don't get me wrong. Like Personally, I, I like Ashlands a lot. I, I don't like the vanilla experience um, just because of like how tricky it is to to build there but i i did a, a, a yeah. my my ashlands playthrough on my server at least there's basically it's a no map no portal world so of course doing ashlands with no portals is like it's really challenging That's right brutal. yeah exactly <laughs> um and like even getting the materials there to build anything and it, it's really really challenging so i did that vanilla and i was like this is not uh, an experience people are gonna enjoy or even get to most of the time so i changed it so instead of that there's like a pre-built arterial path so you can basically progress down this path and the further you get down the path that is your progression so by the time you get all the way to the ashlands i mean you have to pass through mistlands pass through mobs and these things you can't just run there straight away right um, and that right. experience is really cool. But as, it, as, as far as the Deep North itself goes, I only know what Iron Gate has said in interviews. And they've indicated that it's going to be like the biome with the most uh, stuff given because it's the end biome. So they've indicated that like, like, okay, for Ashlands, for example, they didn't have some daggers. They had the axes, but they didn't make a point to do a new type of every single weapon. Whereas, at least uh, in one of the interviews I watched, they were like, well, in the end, there should be one of everything. Because it's the end, you know? It's, it's, it's where everything is. Right. And, Absolutely. And they also have that same attitude with the build pieces. So, supposedly, I mean, in the interview with, I think it was with Grimm, they, they basically were being asked about the Ashland's build pieces. And his response was, oh... Just wait till the deep north. That's where all of the rest of them are. <laughs> so, so my impression is that deep north is going to unlock a lot of building stuff. Um, Ashlands gave us loads of build pieces already. So even if they just give us that many again, that would be awesome. Um, but as far as excitement in these things go, I, I, I honestly don't. I'm not really that fussed about it. Uh, like I was really interested in the ashlands but then I, I had this experience with the server where i had this server the path to ashlands and it was all about preparing for the ashlands right and it taught me a lot about valheim players and it's my cat <laughs> um, <laughs> basically Friend. yeah what what happened is that people would join the server to prepare for ashlands right but then when ashlands came out the server died. Everyone left. <laughs> like, and, and basically, it's because, okay. it's because in Valheim, the game is more about preparing than actually doing. So if you observe players, That's true. they will often prepare for things that they never end up doing, like uh, tame, tamers and breeders, for example. People will set situations up where they basically get an unlimited supply of uh, leather scraps and boar meat and these things. And then, like, they stop playing. I'm not saying that always happens, but it, it's quite a common trope, basically, that I've observed in, in other places. I had not thought of that, but yeah, it's true. I yeah. see that. No. And so. I actually, I know quite a few people that have done that. Yeah. So for me, like, I am excited about things, but I'm not excited about the Deep North itself. Not that I think it's going to be bad. It's just that I understand that, like, the best and most enjoyable parts about Valheim are building and playing with others in the community aspect of it. So, like, the things that's exciting about Deep North for me are what, what that opens up about the world and the fact that 
once they get all these biomes added, they can actually start like trying to polish up the whole game. They've mentioned that for 1.0, basically the last thing I heard that their plan is is that they're going to they're working on Deep North and they'll take a break and then they're going to work on 1.0 like finishing everything up, polishing it, making it so that it really feels how they like um because because of the way Valheim was developed, they were sort of forced to to focus a lot once it became popular on just optimizing. And I know people don't think that they did that, but for the first like year or two, really, uh, it was all just optimizing, trying to fix terrain problems, make it so terrain doesn't cause lag, all this kind of stuff. And that was mm-hmm. like where a lot of their time went. So for me, I'm more excited about what do they mean by polishing it? Like that's the sort of thing. I want to see what they do. Um, and like, they, they've talked about updating the ocean biome and make it more like dangerous and interesting. And like that for me seems interesting because the ocean you interact with in between everything. It's a fundamental part of the experience. Whereas the end game areas, they are really cool. But again, for the vast majority of players, they're never going to experience them. So from a game development perspective, it's just not as interesting to me. Um, Because I know, like, for example, when I try and get people to join a server from making YouTube videos, uh, you could spend hundreds of hours making really cool stuff in the Ashlands, and yeah, you might get a player or two, but that's it. Whereas you can just take Vanilla Valheim, make a YouTube video that gets maybe 100 views, and show a spot in the Black Forest and say, like, we're going to start a town here, and you can get loads of players. So it's... For me, just not as interesting in the later parts of the game because it's just not accessible to people. They don't... I can't get players to come and join. And without players in the world, the magic isn't there. You know, it doesn't feel... Yeah. uh, Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Like I said earlier, part of the charm of it is being there with other people. Friends, family, or new friends. People that you never met before until that server came into existence. And now you guys hang out all the time. And it does make the game more fun. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But but what about you? What are you you thinking about with the Deep North? Or excited about? um, A couple things. One thing, um, I I really hope with the new mobs are going to add, no more wolves. No more werewolves, please. I'm done with those. Everybody hates wolves. Anybody that's played the game Gone in the Mountains the first time knows how how much you hate wolves. Please, no more wolves. But I think for the end game boss, the final boss, I want to see something different. I don't want to go get three dragon eggs. I don't want to get nine pieces of a bell to assemble to a ring to bring the boss. I would I would like to see something like Trials, where the first trial you go to, you have to go in. I don't know how they could do it, but maybe you go into a zone where your first trial are yetis. You have to to beat and they're mini bosses kind of and you'd have to and that would almost have to require more people to come in because of the difficulty level then once you finish that then you could go on to something else like maybe frost giants would be their next step in the progression uh things along the the um viking mythology for the in anything cold and as it progressed, maybe the final boss could be uh, Fenris, I believe, that, that wolf's name, the giant wolf. I said no more wolves, but that would be an exception, because that would be a cool boss to fight. Uh, something along those lines, instead of just, uh, I need to go grab some ancient seeds, or I need to go get some deer head, just um, do something like that. But I'm hoping, I'm not sure, sure if you're familiar with the game Planet Crafter. But that is no, a very fun I, I game. I haven't heard that game, or I haven't played it. It's it's an amazing, it's it's a chill game because there's no monsters to fight. It's a nice change of pace if you want to just kind of decompress from all the stress from fighting. But when they went from early access to 1.0, they polished a lot, but they added a lot too, uh, to to everything, and it was just fantastic. And I'm hoping that when they go to 1.0. For Valheim, they do the same thing. Yes, they polish, uh, like you were talking about, polishing everything. But that doesn't mean they can't add more content 
and not necessarily new biomes and new bosses, but little things, quality of life things. Maybe add a kit you can carry with you that you can repair your armor out in the field or your weapon, something like that. Um, little things like that. So I'm hoping for things along those lines, but I'm looking forward to the Great North because I grew up in the in the state of Florida and I'm tired of the heat. I want cold. <laughs> so. Yeah, Ashland is certainly quite a hot place, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, but um, I'm I like the exploration part of the game, and that will be fun. That's why I've loved Ashlands. It's brutal, but it's fun to yeah, explore it's very everything. Fun to explore, definitely. Yeah. I, I honestly, I I love the Ashlands itself. It, it's just the the mechanism of making it more approachable to players is is the part that's a bit weird. But as far as the assets go, the locations, the monsters, the variety, their attacks, I loved it. Like, really, the... Uh, when when Mislins came out, I, I liked Mislins, but I didn't... I don't know, it's just... it. It's very beautiful. The mist... I didn't mind the mist. Now I think it's better without as much mist. I've done some playtesting with that. And... Um, the the way I run the worlds now is there's two layers of mistland. So you have the inner layer, which is closer to the center, mm -hmm. and there there's no mist. There's only mist around the the monst the the skulls that you have to get the soft tissue from. And then there's the outer layer, which is fully misted. So that's like the hardcore part. And because it's closer to the mm -hmm. edge, you also have more starred enemies and that kind of thing, so it's more dangerous. And I found that that is a good balance because then players can have that experience of like mistlands without mist and see how open it is and how beautiful it is because scenically the mistlands with a bit less oh mist it is, is very beautiful beautiful it is by my opinion the most beautiful part of the game um, especially when you find those clearings that are like sort of open fields and like with a diverger tower or something it's really really beautiful that was a, a side note about the mist itself. that's a brilliant that idea a, a controversial topic and there's many ways to manage the mist by the way with ewp you can make it so uh you like throw a certain kind of item next to a brazier and it deletes the nearby mist you can make it so after the queen gets killed all the mist goes away um, there's lots of things you can do with expand world prefabs that are That's totally cool. vanilla uh, you can really alter a lot of the game mechanics so personally now that i understand this stuff i don't really view it as iron gate's job to make that part perfect. Because from my perspective, they're the ones who make the assets. They're the ones who make the base mechanics. But then because we can have servers, we can sort of alter and customize them. So in my head, it's not that big of a deal if they don't get the balance for the mist right, because yeah, players may not realize they can alter it on a server, but they can, that's the reality, right? So, so for me, I'm not too picky about those things. Um, but as far as the Deep North goes, the, the one thing that I have noticed is it's one of the favorite places for people to build. And part of that is because of how yes. empty and vacant it is, right? But I'm hoping that they will keep that in mind because they're, they're very much are people who love to build in the Deep North. That's very much a thing. And when the Ashlands update came out the terrain was altered right so a lot of people's buildings were lost and i was actually quite surprised Born. Yep. Um, i thought deep north building was more niche but i saw how many people were like no we lost every and i was like damn people are actually building there like even though <laughs> from iron gates perspective they're like you're building in an undeveloped biome full of placeholders that we told you was going to vanish so don't get mad at us <laughs> you know and i i respect i understand what why they did what they did but that's that's just to get back to your question about Deep North. I, I'm hoping that that, whatever they do, I hope they do it in a way that keeps the Deep North uh, appealing to, to people who like to build. And I'm not sure how they're going to manage that with the whole, the, the intensity of the Ashlands. And if Deep North is after Ashlands in progression, I'm not sure. They, they've said that they wanted Ashlands to be the war place, though. So maybe... Maybe Deep North won't be as as intense, you know. I didn't uh, hear that. So yeah, well, that was their their theme. They were like, Ashlands is war. It is combat. It is ruins. That is the the thing they're very much going for, and with the notion of like sieging. They forces. nailed it. And yeah, yeah, definitely. I, it it really feels that way. Um, so maybe yeah, maybe the Deep North won't 
be like a constant war zone? I, I don't know. It's it's all theoretical. That'll make right? the builders happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it'll also be interesting because like what what happens when you kill the last boss? Because I mean, there's a lot they could do. You know, like they could make it so you know some part of the game's mechanics change at that point or the the locations that spawn in the world suddenly become more dangerous versions you know and i i personally am really drawn to the idea that like like you said i think all of us are sort of fed up with like okay get part one two three put it in spawn summon boss fight boss you know that that's the same mechanic throughout the entire game and i, I will say the fader boss fight is epic it is really awesome the, oh it is fun the, it is very fun the boss just looks so cool his attacks are amazing and as far as the expand world prefabs go fader has some of the coolest visual effects like he's got loads of different attack effects that you can use for all sorts of different things and uh i, very I, cool. I really love that but the thing that was confusing about it is it feels like the boss of the game like at least for me, that's how it felt. It felt like this is the it, epic it was boss fight. a tough fight. fight. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of wondering. I'm like, how are they going to do that in the deep north, you know? Like, do, you, do they just one-up it that's, again? Or, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, who, tough. who knows? It's all theoretical, right? Right. That, I'm sure they could do it, but that'll be tough. tough. A tough act to follow. Yeah. Here's one more question about the modding aspect. Do you use plan build as well when you're yeah, creating actually. things? Um, Does that work well I... with EWP? So the way I use plan build, I don't actually have plan build on the server. Um, you can have plan build on your server in a way where other people don't have to have it as far as I know. But w the way I use plan build is when I'm trying to make really expansive stuff. So for example, when I made the sky path, which is like a path that weaves in and out of the mistlands and then goes all the way to the ashlands. I mean, it's in the sky, it has to be invincible, otherwise it would fall apart, right? Or you'd need all the stabilization. Right. And then what if a player breaks part of it? Then like it's useless, right? So, so it has to be invincible and it has to um, go extremely long distances. So for stuff like that, plan build is phenomenal. It's really, really useful. But I don't use plan build when I'm actually playing. I only use plan build for world building. Um, and it's, it's not required, because you can use Infinity Hammer to place plan build blueprints. Um, so it depends what you're trying to do. Like if you have a building that you've already built and you want to save it, the best way is with plan build. Like as far as I know, it really is the most intuitive, once you learn how to use it, it's pretty fast. Uh, it's confusing at first, but once you learn like, okay, what does the center point do? What do the snap point markers do? How do I select everything? How do I save it? Where does it get stored on the computer? Where's the blueprints folder? Uh, once you get all that stuff down, it's pretty intuitive to use and it's very, very useful. So I use it for server building, but not for actual playing. But it does have features like that. Like if you play on a plan built server, as as many modded servers, they'll, they'll, they, they do that. Um, you can literally like go into a house and then click on the little blueprint and it puts it in your folder. And then you have the blueprint for that house, you know? So there, there's a lot of really useful features that plan build can do. And it also has this whole ghost building system where you can basically have a chest and you you build your, your place, but you're just building like a... a an image of it, basically. So you wear this special item that makes you see the pieces as if they're there, but they're not actually there. And then you build a mm -hmm. special chest. And so you'll build the ghost image of your place and everything. And then if you look at the chest, it'll say like, oh, okay, you need 6,400 wood, 253 iron, 600 core wood. And as you put them in the chest, it'll just build the base and, and one of the really interesting things about it is let's say that base then gets damaged like by a troll or something you can literally just put the material back in the chest and it'll finish it'll heal it'll rebuild those pieces so oh that's cool yeah there are ways to use plan build if it's on your server again though this isn't a client 
So it's not vanilla friendly. So you would have to have the clients install plan build and the server install plan build. But that can really add some, some really fascinating features to the building component that make the Valheim experience more, more friendly to people. Uh, because Valheim, vanilla, the, the destructive elements are a little bit too overtuned. So like the ground is shaking event, for example, it does more than just give you a little bit of danger. It'll devastate your builds, you know? It'll completely eradicate parts of it. And, you know, people will oh, quit sure. playing after they, they lose enough of something. It's one thing if a troll lands one hit on an outer wall and breaks part of it and leaves, but that's not what the event does, right? You know, they keep going. And, <laughs> no, they keep coming. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and so with plan build, it makes it not matter so much because you don't have to spend all of the time individually rebuilding that stuff from scratch you just get the resources put them back in the chest and then it fills them up again so it makes you not so afraid of losing everything and um, i've never right. played on a server like that but i've i've seen enough about how the mod works that it's like yeah i i think that would be a great experience for people who are interested in it and there's loads of people who like yeah i i focus on vanilla I make all the server work I do vanilla friendly so anybody can join without having to install a mod pack. I think that's really important for like longevity mm -hmm. and the amount of players you can get. Um, and it's also quite fun exactly. just dealing with the limitations and that sort of thing, right? Because technically, if you're using a mod pack, you can just make anything happen. You know, you can literally Pretty alter much. anything. There's no constraints. Um, whereas with, with vanilla, you have to kind of work with the constraints in the game. And that makes kind of like its own game. If, if that makes sense, like the act of figuring out how to get it to work becomes the game that you're playing. And it, it's really, really rewarding once you figure out exactly what needs to be where and what you needed to do to make it happen. So yeah, just to answer your question, I, I, don't, I don't use plan build like on my actual playing experiences, but it's a very critical component for server building. Um, like if you're, you mentioned like building a town so that people can play in it, you could go about having your own playthrough and doing it vanilla, but that would take so long that by the time you finish the town, you're probably sort of done with that playthrough for now. You need to take a break and do something else. Whereas if you use plan build, oh, you could make a whole town in a week and you can like move buildings around and place them other places. And like from the server running perspective, um, people on the Path to Ashland server would often overbuild. They'd build too close to each other and make the communal areas unplayable. And all they had to do is just plan build, to take the server down, put it on a local, my local computer, use plan build, mm -hmm. copy the building, just move it 100 yards away. Like you can't do that in base Valheim. You have to rebuild the whole thing from scratch. Thing. You know what I mean? You can't just <laughs> yeah. shift a building to the left. So in that way, plan build is a it's critical for server building and world building. Really, it's, uh, it adds features that are just so much deeper than what other things do. Whereas if you're placing blueprints, then you don't really need plan build. You can just use Infinity Hammer to place the blueprints, and it works fine. Ah, oh, cool. That's good to know. I appreciate the tips and the advice. Uh, yeah, just wait, wait till you watch uh, the interview with Dakar. It's uh, he. I can't. I've seen him on the um, the VWE server yeah. Discord channel, and he's the stuff that I've looked at. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's shocking. And if you've ever seen the adventure map or the the RPG server, that's a, a like collaboration project uh, led by Dakar and Nine Byte. So I'm Nine Byte, I did. I actually try. I tried it out. Yeah. I, I, I was curious, and I had to jump in, and that was unbelievable what they did. Yeah, it's a it game in a game. Crazy, it really is, and it's a brilliant idea that they came up with to do that. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's all in the interview. He talks about like what led to that and how they met and all that. So, so I haven't actually joined the server though. I just know about it. So could you tell me? What was it like? Like when you joined? Um, I've seen imagery of it, and I've seen some video. But right. I haven't actually taken the time because I know like this isn't something I'll just do for an hour. Like when I'm not playing any games and I want to like you know play something for a couple weeks, uh, I'll do that. But I'm not ready for that yet. I'm too busy right now. It was a lot of fun because there was a linear progression that um, 
I really enjoyed, and and that was one thing why I why I was asking you about um, adding things to the server because I want to make it more replayable and keep people in, interested. And that was that actually was the first thing that made me think about replayability with bringing people back, keeping them on the server, because yeah. there's so much to do and so many locations to go to, and there's one point where you don't you have to make a brand new character. And you go in there and you have to run, take a path alongside a mountain, and you start to freeze. But they've placed every so often campfires that allow you to warm up so you don't die, yeah. which yeah. I thought was, was a really nice touch that they did that. But going from town to town and interacting with some of the quests that they have in there, very, very cool. I'm not going to spoil anything for you, but it, it, it added an element to the game that isn't there. Yeah, uh, it, it 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 was no longer just a survival game. There were things to do, and it wasn't just a simple go kill ten bears and bring back their pelts. I, you know, it was you need to go to this point and help with this and do the and, and the swamp area is really cool. If you get a chance to play it, I highly recommend it. Oh, yeah. I haven't gotten much farther yeah, than the swamp, well. but that was. It's they they did a great job, and it looks amazing. Yeah, the, the things that they have added to the game, and I'm guessing they used uh, the the prefab, the uh, prefab mods for that. They had yeah. to have because it's just yeah. So they you he, tip he your was telling me he was telling me basically that a lot of stuff they they've done there it, it really wasn't possible like a year ago. It's because of some things that Yere has added that enable you to do stuff because correct me if i'm wrong you don't need mods to play on that server right or to like you can just add no, a world no. file right yeah mm -hmm. that, that's that's fascinating it's definitely definitely something i want to i want to check out um maybe i'll like make some content about it some some somehow or find like a group of people to to do it with at some point and do some kind of event uh, maybe you could help me actually with there's this issue I've noticed where I want to get people aware of the things that are possible with expand world prefabs and that sort of thing. And I, I'm making a lot of the tutorials, but the thing about the tutorials is for the average Valheim player, they're not really that relevant. So I'm trying to figure out, like, how can I make something that is relevant, but doesn't necessarily show them how to do it, but shows them, holy crap, that's really cool. I always wanted that. Like, is, is there anything in particular that you think is like, wow, if, if Jack made a video about this, like... Maybe, um... Well, that's going to be tough because I'm still learning about um, all of those mods myself. But maybe a showcase of things that you can do. Not telling them how to do it, just saying, have you ever wanted to do this to a town? Or have you ever wanted to have a home inside a cave, for example? Or, you know, when you're building, if you dig that hole, there, you can't dig underground. Unlike in Shrouded, you can't dig. It's not voxel. But with the prefab, world prefab, uh, expanded world prefab, you can do that, if I'm not mistaken, correct? You can make it so you can basically build an ice mountain, for example, and have a home inside the mountain with what you've built. Is that correct? Sort of. Like, you can't, you can't alter the way terrain only has one place in Valheim. So the terrain right. is always going to be... It's sort of like 2D in that sense. Like, it can't have, you can't have terrain with more terrain on top. There has to be one terrain level. But you can make it so that, like, assets go on top of it, right? And so you could make right. a mechanism for vanilla players to spawn rocks above to make a cave. Make sense? Whereas in normal Valheim, yes. you would need a mod to spawn the non-buildable assets. But with Expand World Prefabs, you could make it so when the player places a workbench and then they place a forge right next to it, or, or for example, let's say they just place a workbench and then they say the word, uh, you know, cave, then the rock spawns 20 feet above the workbench. You can, you can make things that you normally require mods for happen 
using expand world prefabs. Again, as long as you're making, you're using an existing thing, like a workbench mm -hmm. or any piece in the game and an interaction from the player as the trigger, then you can have the game put other things on top and you're not limited to what the player can do. So, so yes, you could make a cave or a tunnel system, but you couldn't alter the fact that the terrain only has one level. Because the game itself has... Right, you like, give the illusion of being underground. Yes, exactly. Um, so the, the game maybe itself, if you could sh showcase that. Yeah, and, and as you were speaking, I realized like just a showcase video of what's possible with Expand World Prefabs with no explaining at all. It could literally be like, here's an example of what you can do. Here's another example. Here's another example. Purely to show all the different kinds of mechanisms that are possible. And I haven't done a video like that. I've always thought about how to show them how to make it. But a, it's mm -hmm. almost like a demo. Like, this is possible. This is possible. This is possible. And it's like, if I time it right, I could make it so the, the video starts and it, it does something you think is impossible. And then it does something you think is even more impossible. And then it shows something that you think is even more impossible. You know, and it just keeps boom, boom, <laughs> boom. And that, that, that sounds no, like a good idea. I don't know if this is something that Expand World Prefab can do, but can you make it so you can tame a troll, for example? Yes. So it's not that you can tame the troll, but the way the summoning system I made, you can download this. It's in the configs in the Valheim World Editing Group. But basically, you take trophies, oh, okay. and you mm -hmm. throw them on the floor. And if you throw three trophies on the floor, and then you say summon, it summons that monster but it's aggressive. But then if you throw six trophies on the floor and you say summon, it summons that monster, but it's tamed. It's friendly to you. So you can literally... See, that's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. And it, it makes it so you can make That would be guards. perfect in your showcase. Yeah, yeah. That, that's something... I think I... I don't remember if I made a video about the summoning system or not. The, I, I started I with Expand that, World Prefabs with more sort of experimental stuff. Um... Whereas now I have, I have like ulterior motives in trying to get people <laughs> to 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 actually get interested and do things right. I'm not just like oh look at this cool thing, um, but yeah that that's very easy actually because the tamed it's just a field, so you can very easily make it so any monster in the game. I'm not a, I don't know how it works with bosses, but I mean I on the server I run you can summon a friendly Valkyrie, like. The thing is, they don't follow you. That, so they, they're just like other enemies. They have like a home spot that is where you spawned them. And they'll stay around that mm -hmm. area. And they may chase something away. So you could like have them chase something away for long enough that you get them somewhere else. But uh, it's more complicated to like have them follow you the way a wolf can follow you, for example. Maybe you could like take that component of the wolf and put it in a monster. I'm not sure. I haven't done that. Uh, for for my purposes, for the summoning system, the idea is to give usage to trophies because they're trash material for most most trophies. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah they so are. There's, there's I mean, two. how many how many deer heads can you put on a wall? Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's two two mechanisms I'm using to deal with the trophies. One is the summoning system. So let's say you want um, you want deer meat and you have deer trophies. Well, you just summon a deer and kill it, and then you get, you get the loot. Because oh yeah, everything's two star. So so when you summon something with three trophies, it summons an aggressive two star version of that monster. So it, it gives a way to convert trophies into the resources that the monster drops, which makes the trophies like have a use, right? And then additionally. Uh, I added a, a raid system, and I'm still working on this, getting it. That's one of the videos I'm making, actually. Because um, I've encountered that there's a lot of conflict between players with progression, because one player progressing on the server alters everyone else's progression. Even if you have uh, mm -hmm. character-based progression, that doesn't really matter, because once you get to kill Yugluth, there's going to be goblins in the meadows at night. For everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's a game-breaking experience for the people who are still in the meadows and haven't so like uh, from my perspective that's bad game development you shouldn't give 
players the ability to just play normally and in doing so they screw over the others on the server so what i did is i made it so that um basically you turn raids off but instead of having no raids the way it works is any trophy that is associated with a raid will when you place it run a chance every 10 minutes or every minute i don't remember what exactly i set it up for to summon that raid and it's completely independent of character progression and everything else so you could have like that's, that's a, a level idea. two character and if they get a charred trophy and they put it on their wall technically they have a small chance for that charred raid but then if they get 10 charred trophies they're gonna get that raid so it gives you a way to um add more value add more usage to the trophies but also make it mm -hmm. so that the the players can opt into raids and i think that's an important part because i found that there a lot of the builders on my server for example they do want some chaos they do want things to attack their base but when they're ready for it it needs to be consensual so the idea yes. with the trophy raid system is to allow players to choose the raids that they want and if you want a lot of variety and danger then just put a bunch of different trophies of all different kinds and you'll get every raid imaginable um and then if there's too many just take them down and the raids stop happening and i found that this is a it seems to work better that way because that way you can have a player and they can progress um and they don't have to worry about like oh i just killed a troll now everyone on the server is going to get the ground is shaking event because even if it was player-based raids, if you were online, when that troll died, you get the key. So you may have not seen it. You didn't get any message that someone else killed a troll, but it happened. So you get the key, and now you can get ground to shaking. Um, so it's like yep. it's easier to work around all of those problems by sort of like disabling the current raid system. And then the other thing I'm working on is an alternative boss system. Um, I, I, do you want to hear about this? I, it would probably take me a bit to explain. Yeah, if you don't mind. I'm curious. It's like a sneak peek of uh, your upcoming videos. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to those. So, yeah, I, I don't mind at all, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I'm of the belief that the bosses in Valheim are the worst part of Valheim by far. Um, the reason I say that is because when I've looked at what happens, players, one, they rush through bosses to try and beat bosses, they often beat a boss and then quit. Or mm -hmm. they have a group experience that's a laggy, conflicted mess where they die a bunch and corpse run and then eventually they kill the boss. That experience itself usually isn't that enjoyable, but if you are with other people who are chatty and in the right mood, it can be really fun. But it's not the game that's making it fun, it's those other, the social activity, right? So absolutely that combined with this notion that Valheim needs things in the background that make you feel like you haven't beaten everything. And I don't really like the way that the progression is like, okay, you clear the meadows, you're done with the meadows, you got everything in the meadows, now you're in the Black Forest. You clear that, you're done with that, you got every, everything in it. Yeah, maybe you need to go back to the meadows to get some raspberries or something, but there's no challenge there. There's nothing else that is a remaining thing for you to do. So what I'm working on is I'm basically making it so all bosses are end game content. So you don't progress through killing bosses. Instead, you find the boss altar and there is a riddle. There's like a rune stone with a special magical chest. And you close the chest and reopen it. A lightning bolt strikes the chest and you get the crypt key. And this way, you never kill the elder. That's a good idea. You never activate the keys you do nothing to influence other players' progression. It's completely based on you and what items you've acquired. But also, you don't get the trophy and you don't get the boss power. So if you want to do that, you have to actually fight the boss, right? But in this alternative system, the bosses are pretty much unkillable until you have, like Eek, for example, two of them get summoned and they're 12-star versions. So like you're not killing him oh my God. and you, you only have like 10 minutes and then they disappear. So like you can't cheese him for an hour. You have to actually do enough damage to kill him. And obviously you 
most players can't do that. It's great. Right? So the idea is that the player gets to progress through the biomes, but they know, I still haven't beaten him. I still haven't killed right. the boss of the meadows. I still haven't killed the elder. So once they get... I haven't figured out the exact balance for this, but the idea is they can't even kill Eek until they're like in the mountains or they've started dabbling in the plains. And then they can do enough damage that they can go back and kill Eek. And like that way the bosses have this effect of like being this thing in the background that adds to the end game experience. And you get the like, I mean, Eek's power is it's fucking it's crazy good. It's like probably the best power in the game, to be honest, because it you can just run and the stamina from that is incredibly useful. Obviously, Bone Masses is also really good, but the, some of the boss powers are like really powerful, right? So the idea is to mm -hmm. push them out of the player's experience, and also as part of this, this is, again, this system has a lot of different components because in order for people to actually use my chests the bosses have to slaughter them because they're just going to play how they're used to playing, right? So if I let them and I don't make Eek hard, they're not going to do my alternative way to kill Eek. They're just going to kill Eek because all you need is three deer trophies or two whatever it is and like a crude bow. Right. You know, he's got like 100 health, whatever it is, and he's dead. He's like a really disappointing boss in the long scheme of things. At first, he's really badass. And oh, the yeah. music's epic, and it's awesome getting killed by his lightning once or twice, but ultimately, <laughs> if you have any sense of what but he's I see doing, what you're saying. Yeah, he's, he's just not, not a threat, right? And he looks so cool and so epic, and he's the guardian oh, of yeah, the, the woods and stuff. So why is he just... You just kill him naked with a crude bow, you know? It, <laughs> it, it's like... For me, that's world-breaking. It doesn't... It just doesn't fit, right? So that's why... Basically, I've made it so um, when one player summons the boss, it's an incredibly hard version of the boss. But if there's two players present when the boss is spawned, it's a little bit weaker. And if there's three players present, it's even weaker. And if there's four, then it's the weakest version of that boss. And the idea here is that... Um, the, the boss experience has to deal with the reality that combat in multiplayer in Valheim is very laggy. So yes. no matter how you square that, that's going to cause a problem. And the reality is if you bring an incompetent player, they're going to cause more harm to everybody else's experience simply because their presence increases lag and it increases the boss's health. So it creates a scenario where, yes, maybe having more players helps, but technically, logistically, the more players, the more challenging the boss fight. They get more health, and they also, you have to deal with the fact that it can look like he shot a lightning bolt there, and you were over there, but you still died. He teleported to you and killed you through some lag shit, you know what I mean? So... The idea yep, <laughs> is to rework it so that the mere presence of a player makes the fight more manageable, even if it's laggy, by reducing the health of the boss instead of increasing the health makes of sense. the boss. But you can see how that doesn't work unless the boss with one player is incredibly strong. Because if, if the boss with one player is normal, then like it's already too weak. So if you just make it weaker and weaker with each player, I mean, it's just right, not so as magical. To, yeah. And yeah, and like yeah. for me, again, I, I've noticed that like something magical happens in a game when you think you can do something and you go try and do it and you just get slaughtered. And then you go and you do yeah. other stuff and you come back later when you're stronger and you're able to, to do it that time, right? So that's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to capture with the alternative boss progression system is to make it so that players are one, they get something to go back to, you know, you, you progress through the meadows, you get the pickaxe, you get the swamp key, you can get iron, you can have the whole Valheim experience without the bosses. And then when you and your friends are really ready, you can start practicing to kill that boss, but it's not something you can just do once. It's, it's too, too challenging and too, too intense. 
But by having these time limits where the boss vanishes if you don't kill him fast enough, I can prevent the players from wasting too much of their time. Because I'm right. sure you've had this experience where like you'll go with a group of people to play and it's like it's like hours and it's kind of like uh, usually what happens is like one or two players do most of the damage and everyone else just sort of corpse runs their way over there and dies and corpse runs again <laughs> and it, it's a mess you know yep. what I mean so and that's another thing you can remove skill removal completely so like um, in base Valheim the the most you can remove skill removal is 1%. So you'll always lose 1% if, even if the slider is all the way down. But if you actually like mm -hmm. add a cron job to set the key manually every time a player joins and the server starts, you can make it so you don't lose any skills. But unfortunately, it does seem to be sort of hard-coded, as far as I know, that your, your level will get reset to zero experience. So like, let's say you're level 90 and you die... You're not going to go to level 89, but you will lose all of your progress for the level. And I find that that's more... Um, it makes it so death isn't artificially a bad thing. I, I don't know why they are convinced right. that they have to punish That would be a good trade-off, though, to be honest with you. Yeah, and th that's the idea. So that's the mechanics of the, the whole alternative boss system. Uh, but again, it's it, I need... Like, I need to set it up, I need to have all these components working, and then I need it to be, like, play-tested, because it has to... Yeah, it's complicated, because if the player doesn't know this is a thing, they just quit. <laughs> like, you know, they, they spawn what? an eek, and he just... There's two of them, and they gank him, and they're just like, nope. So they have to, like... You have to <laughs> communicate with the players and give them options, and, like, in, in my case, the, the way it works is, like, there's only one place you can go to summon eek, and like you go there and there's a warning and like I was trying to get it so Odin spawns and he's like, wait, don't do this, wait. <laughs> but I, I, I haven't figured out how to get it to trigger properly because um, Odin's really cool. Cause he that would be very cool. That sort of thing. And, and like what I found is if you, with these custom servers, it's really useful for you to know vanilla Valheim inside out. So you know like, okay, a normal Valheim player will join, they'll do this, then this, then this, then this. And instead of, because like anytime you modify something, you also have to teach the player that it's modified, otherwise they won't do it. And say that you've modified a hundred things, players aren't gonna read a hundred different rules. They're just gonna play, you know. So you have to make the game teach them the modification. Makes sense. And that part. Yes, be, it does. And that would be the tricky part. Exactly. Yeah, it can be quite tricky. So that's why I set it up. So like, okay, they go to the thing. And at first it was like, all right, there's this chest thing and this runestone. So you can read the runestone and it's very obvious. Oh, if I put these things in the chest, I'll get the boss's treasure. But I could just go kill two deer. <laughs> you know, so I'm going to go do that instead of go do what yeah. it wants me to do. And then, but then you do that and you just get ganked and you're like, ah, all right, now I do, right? So you have to, oh. <laughs> you have to really keep in mind how people play and make it so the act of playing normally teaches them the modifications. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're just going to make a bunch of changes and most of your players won't interact with them. So that, that part's been really fun. But again, it, like you need to play test things. And that's something that people sort of struggle with because they'll make a bunch of changes. But then like they need actual other people to play them and try them. You know, and maybe you have one or two friends or maybe if you're lucky, five or six people who like Valheim. But it's genuinely quite challenging for like average people who don't have YouTube channels and these things to actually get playtesting done. So I'm in a unique position right. where I can get things playtested and uh, that, that's definitely quite exciting. So that's the alternative boss progression system. <laughs> I like that. that. That is actually very, very cool. And uh, I would like to see that when it gets done because that, that makes the game more, more playable. Makes it... Yeah. Or you're not just what we just talked about. It's it's more entertaining that way. Yeah. So that, that would be cool. That's the whole notion with the Path of Magic server is it's like huge changes to Valheim's mechanics, but in a way where you learn them by trying to do things normally. And because I noticed, as I mentioned earlier, what happens with Valheim is once the player gets to a point where they can predict what's happening... Yeah, everyone says that everything should be fair and predictable. 
I, I don't buy that. I don't think that's actually true. You need the right level of unpredictability because then the person has that feeling of, I don't know what's going to happen. And it's really important for immersion that they don't quite get it, especially if they think they get it and then they have an experience. It's like, oh, no, I don't get it. Right. So that's <laughs> oh yeah. that's the, the whole idea with the Path of Magic server is constantly remind the player, this isn't the Valheim you're used to. And there's lots of different things. Like uh, it has a, a loot system, but not like epic loot. So most of the time, it's just normal. But every now and then, you'll get a tasty mead or like the Fenring hood every 10,000th kill. There's a chance. Like, I'm not saying you have to kill 10,000 things, but there's these really low probabilities that when they happen, mm-hmm. they're like, whoa, they feel special, basically. Um, so like, there's a That's whole cool. bunch of things I've added like that. Like, you can make it so the game reacts to the ragdoll of the enemy disappearing by spawning something. So basically, you can make any item in the game have a 1 out of 10,000 chance to spawn in the meadows when anything is killed in the meadows. And then if anything is killed in the Black Forest, something else. So I basically set it up so that there's not just the boss progression, you can also get lucky. Let's say you're killing things in the meadows. There's a one in one thousandth chance that you'll just get a hard antler as a drop, right? So technically, I mean, somebody could kill 10 deer and one of them drops a hard antler. But these things are like, they're supplementary. You can't really tell players because if they know too much, Mm -hmm. they'll try and game it. And that's why, like, I found that common drop rates don't work at all. You have to have really rare drops because that way it's too tedious to just try and get it to happen. But if you're playing normally, it just happens naturally, right? And you can do the same thing with... um, So another part of the Path to Magic server is that it has modifications to the Cultivator, the Hoe, and the Hammer, and all these. So, like, you're literally making a path, and then every now and then you'll get a one of the best stamina food in the game just one so you can't like make more of it out of that but you have that 120 stamina until you run out of it that one time and like so you can add all these little these little things that just happen and they spice things up they keep it so like yeah you're building and then every you know one out of every 200 times you build something a pile of 20 wood shows up it just helps you build a little more that, that sort of thing it helps add some some like nuance that. to it yeah and that that's something that the players on my server really helped me with because at first the dropper weights were too common and you could just like spam click stuff to make it happen and so i basically kept adjusting them as the players were playing until they were like yeah it feels good now it doesn't happen enough that it's often but when it does happen you're like whoa it, you get this little buzz of like yeah th- that's awesome and, and well, everybody loves rare drops. Yeah, yeah. But I, I didn't make it so, like, you can get anything in the game, but there are certain things, like the whole Fenring set. Because this server I play on, is it's all about, like, figuring out how to make the, the, the Valheim experience kind of as immersive as possible. So it's a no-map, no-portal server, which already makes it much more challenging. But and it's also on very hard combat. So you get wrecked, right? But that was a problem because then people completely stopped using the block system because you just die in one shot and it's really hard. On very hard, the, the blocking and heavy armor is basically negated. It doesn't work. So everybody was using oh, really? like ranged and magic. Yeah, it's just too much damage. So you can't, like you have to keep your block skill above like 80 and use the best shields in the game. And like blocking is a big part of the game for most people. So that element makes very mm-hmm. hard just not manageable. So one of the things I did is I made it so any block gives you a bubble shield for one minute provided you can survive that first hit, which means that you have to have enough health to not get killed by that. And then you'll get a bubble shield. And once you have the bubble shield, the parrying system works much more effectively. And the bubble shield may only have 100 health which in vanilla Valheim is a lot, but in very hard mode, a goblin, or not a goblin, a gray dwarf brute will one hit you. Like even if you have armor and stuff, it'll just wreck you, right? So by having a bubble shield, even if you take a 900 damage hit, it'll break the shield and you won't die. 
but that next hit will kill you unless you block again. Right. So it makes this, like, what I like in games, uh, I, I won't get too much into this, but basically I view game development as we've been copying Dungeons and Dragons religiously and we need to get over that shit. It's been like 20, 30 years and we're still using these ancient archetypes that are based off of a tabletop RPG. And we took some of the best parts of that and we just threw them away. Like there were these things called Dungeon Masters. And we were like, no, the computer's the Dungeon Master now. But what if every server had a player whose whole job is to make it as interesting as possible for all the other, all the other players? And they had so Oh, sure. Power, you know, like there's so many things that can be done with that. But the thing I was getting at is that all games have this archaic health system where it's like, okay, you have 100 health, gets to zero, you die. Strong enemies do more damage, others do less. But it makes a problem occur because once you get strong enough, how threatening is a neck to you? You can literally yeah, just not, exactly. sit there. Nothing can happen to you, right? I don't think that that's good for a gameplay immersion experience. What I believe is that everything should have the potential to kill you. Everything. However, with knowledge and with better gear, you can, as long as you're paying attention, stop that from happening. But even if you're in the Black right. Forest surrounded by Grey Dwarfs, you go AFK in the best gear, you're going to come back and your character's dead. But you can't do that. That breaks the immersion. The moment you cannot be killed, it takes away the, the real feeling of the game. And even though people like getting to that point, that's a psychological thing that once you get there, you don't keep going. You stop playing, right? So that, that, that's the yeah, exactly notion. With the auto-blocking, uh, with the bubble shield system. is like now melee players have an actual it can be viable on very hard mode because now blocking is really important because you have to block so that you get that bubble shield so that you can't be one hit. And that, it, it just like, in practice, it ended up working out really well. And it's a really simple script. Um, so there's the Path of Mag cool. Magic server has loads of, loads of stuff like that. And it's all been like, um, some of them are my ideas, like maybe like 60% of the stuff is my ideas. But the rest are like, I, I basically have people playing on the server and they've learned the kinds of things I can do. So now they're like, what if you did this? Like one of the, one of the players was like, what if fire made plants? And I was like, shit, that would be really interesting. Because <laughs> what happens when players play places, they end up destroying all the vegetation and taking it all away and it never grows back. But with Expand World Prefabs, you can make birds drop plants. You can make them spawn on the ground. You can make it so everything's on a delay. So when something is removed, as long as nothing's built next to it, you know, an hour later it shows back up again as a little shrub. You can actually make regrowing vegetation in the game. And that's what I did on the server. So now when you make a lot of fire, it literally respawns assets that are used to that biome. So if you spread fire in the meadows, It'll make birch trees and beech trees and bushes occasionally. And if you spread cool. fire in the mountains, you'll get the mountains assets. And every now and then you'll get, you know, like if you're in the black forest and you spread enough fires, very rarely you'll spawn a gray dwarf spawner. You can even have like location show up if you really know what you're doing. So it's like, yeah, the, the whole world is your oyster when it comes to like that's the, cool. It's more like when you're trying to understand the limits of these things, it's more about, like, it's not so much what you can do, it's just learning the few things you can't do. Because most of the time, there's a way to do it. And it's, it's really shocking just cool. how much you can customize the game and make it the way you want. And, and like, my, my idea, my general premise is that the server is a player and it's trying to play mm -hmm. you. So everything you do, the server reacts to and works with that and tries to not like screw you <laughs> over, but catch you off looking. guard and get you very confused. Yeah. And there's a, like, for example, one of the, I keep giving all these examples, but one of the other ones for the Path of Magic server is the, the chaos bunnies. So basically every time you, you pick something up, like a dandelion, you, any pickable or like you're farming or whatever, there's a really tiny chance that a white bunny will show up and then it'll run away from you. 
But little do you know, that bunny spawns bombs behind it after 20 seconds. So if you go off chasing <laughs> it, it'll kill you, right? And, and so, like, there's these little things that I've done just that. to really, like, get, get people to be like, what the fuck? Like, and, and so I did that, and then I realized, no, I had to change it a lot because I, in my head, people are out exploring. They pick some thistle or something, and a bunny shows up out in the wild, and they go out, and then, you know, it drops some bombs and then blows up or something, right? But in reality, people are farming in their bases, and the bunny spawns in their base and is trapped in the walls and blows their base up. And that isn't a good experience for people, definitely. No, it's a great uh, troll, but not a good experience. Yeah, yeah. So that's where playtesting comes in. And now they, the, the bunnies can only spawn away from base items. So you can basically set up anything you do with Expander World prefabs. You can have it look at what's nearby and make it only trigger if there's, like, two players or if there's a workbench next to a forge or if there's something else like i made these bombs for example the ward bombs that was one of those videos mm -hmm. and like one of the issues i had is like okay the diverger has like a ward in their base so i made i made the ward bombs <laughs> and then you go and one attack on the diverger base by anything triggers the ward and then the whole building explodes. <laughs> and I was like, all right, how do I work with this? And the answer is just to make it so that the wards behave normally if they're around the Diverger talk component, which is that element that makes the Diverger say things, but it's in every Diverger. Mm -hmm. So if you make sure that within 20 meters of that, nothing happens, then you're fine and everything works. So there's always like a way to make it so it only happens in the situation where you want it to happen. But you often need play testing to realize like, oh shit, of course people pick things more in their farm than out in the nature. But I didn't, right. like now that seems obvious. You know, you may plant a hundred barleys, that's a hundred times you're gonna pick something. How long did it take <laughs> to find a hundred thistle? You know, it's a lot longer. So obviously the bunnies were always spawning in people's houses <laughs> and that was, not what I want, because I try and make it so that the things are safe for the builders unless they leave the meadows, and then things get dangerous. But yeah, that, that, that's the idea. I love that idea. But yeah, I think a video showcasing what you can do would be a great way to get people to want to know, how did you do that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good angle. I'll definitely do that because it, it, and it, it's so much easier too if I don't have to explain everything they need to edit and where to go and all that. I can just tease them, basically. So exactly. That, that's, a, that's a great idea, definitely. That that would be cool. I look forward to a video like that too. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate all the information you've given me because I, like I said earlier, I'm trying to be like a sponge and soak everything up that I can. So I'm I'm excited to jump into it. In fact, I'll be doing that once we finish. <laughs> I'm yeah. gonna start playing around and and uh, work on that and see what I can do. Don't worry about it. Ask these things. It helps me. I appreciate that um, because I learn like the things you're confused by. Other people are confused by. So it helps me make better content. It helps me figure out what to make content about. And also, if you ever want to schedule another one of these calls, especially if there's something specific you want to talk about. You don't even need to talk to me. Just use that same link I sent you. Um, anybody who finds okay. that can just schedule a Valheim chat with me. And the, the payment for me is I get content from my channel. So that's why they're free and I, I love doing these things. It's great. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to, to finally meet you. Yeah. You and again, keep putting those videos out because I'm learning a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I've been trying. So for a while, like... I, I, ha I had been making just like three or four a month, but I'm trying to really like get on it now and make like three or four a week. So um, that's just, I, I'm trying to get back in the habit of doing that because that's what the channel really needs. If mm. you're if you're just making like a video a week on YouTube, it, it can work if you are the really high quality videos that everyone watches. But with this kind of subject, it's very niche. So I have to make lots and lots and lots of content. Um, so that that's my plan. That's where my head's at. And I'll, I, am, I am working on this Path of Magic server, and it's going to be public. So once it comes out, 
that's basically an EWP demo, except instead of just watching the video, you can join the server and play it yourself and see the oh, ridiculousness, cool. right? Yeah, so that, that, that's that how it works. That would be very cool. And I, I was trying to have that come out like a week or two ago, but I realized, I was like, well, why rush? I should just take my time, play test things, make it so it's really solid, um, and then mm -hmm. and then release it when it's really ready. So, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm and, looking uh, forward to that now. Yeah, yeah, it'll be cool. And uh, it, it looks like a lot of the people who are interested are the people who are, want to do some world editing themselves. So it might also be a good way to meet some other players who are interested in doing more than just playing Valheim, right? Exactly. Anyway, exactly. Thanks so much. For, well, it's been for a pleasure. Time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me and, and talking to me about all this. It's been great. <laughs> yeah, it's been fantastic. And to, to those of you watching, if you want YouTube to show you more Valheim videos, then just like this video or any other Valheim video, and then it'll dish out the content, okay? And if any of you know someone who you want me to interview, you can comment below with the recommendation, ask them in person. Um, generally, I, I try not to reach out to people unless I know with certainty that they're genuinely interested. So if you know somebody, talk to them, and then if they seem interested, let me know and I'll interview them. I don't care if they are a new player or they have like a huge following or they're a modder, whatever. Just if they're willing to be on a public video on YouTube, just like you were, then let me know. And I, I would love to hear from, from anyone who's interested in being involved. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next time.